Hugo Boss's Spring Summer 22 campaign was star-studded. The lineup included Kylie Jenner, Hailey Bieber, future sports stars like Anthony Joshua and Matteo Berrettini, and the TikTok superstar KB Lame. What none of them knew and what you guys probably didn't know either was that Hugo Boss was a Nazi brand and was involved with the Nazis during the Second World War. You must be wondering how a Nazi brand would still be in the limelight and manage to bring in some of the most famous personalities to support them. Well, stick with us to find out the history behind Hugo Boss and its association with the Nazis. Hugo Ferdinand Boss, the founder of Hugo Boss, was born in Metzingen, Germany in the year 1885. His family was more or less a lower middle class family. They had a little lingerie shop where they sold underwear, undergarments, and some workwear. It wasn't really as glamorous as the fine suits and trendy clothes that they make now. Being young and healthy, Hugo Boss was drafted into the military and he fought in the First World War. Upon his return after the war, he started his own small tailor shop primarily for undergarments. This was in 1908. Again, this still was not really fashionable. The shop that his parents ran gave him the experience and knowledge to run his own business. However, this wasn't really the best time to start a business. The aftermath of the war was affecting Germany. The German economy was still in a very difficult state. The situation of hyperinflation made savings useless. It was a hard situation for everybody, and it was no different for Hugo Boss. Even though his business was surviving, it was still a struggle. He wanted to expand his line. He also wanted to sell finer garments like suits for gentlemen. But the situation meant that when people barely have money to make their ends meet, why would anyone spend money on a fancy suit? That made him wonder. People would only spend their money on necessities and not a fancy Sunday suit. So what if there was a type of clothing that one cannot forego? And that's when he realized that you need gloves and tight pants for most of the jobs. Thus, in year 1924, he founded a workshop along with the support of his family. The sales, however, was not enough for the business to even sustain itself and keep the operation running. And in the year 1931, Hugo was forced to file for bankruptcy. It hadn't even been 10 years since he launched his business. For most people, this would have seemed like the end of the road, but this wasn't the case for Hugo. Being a young entrepreneur, he traveled across Germany and discovered its political spectrum. That's when he found the party that he believed could bring Germany back to glory and prosperity. He saw the future in the Nazi party, or the NSDAP, which he joined in the year 1931. Under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, the Nazi army was growing rapidly, and more soldiers obviously meant more uniforms to fight the war. This meant there was a huge demand for uniform production. A huge demand to be filled. Hugo saw this opportunity. While filing for bankruptcy, Hugo had persuaded his creditors to leave a few sewing machines. The six sewing machines that the creditors left were used by Hugo to start making uniforms for the Nazis. At the same time, the commander of the SS, or the Schutzstaffel, which was a major paramilitary organization close to Hitler, was in need of a uniform that separated them from the rest. Heinrich Himmler, the commander, wanted the uniform to be distinctive and make a clear difference between the normal soldiers and the SS, which considered themselves an elite force filled with warriors. He was in need of someone who could design such a uniform. Who could come up with a uniform who, which could portray the idea of Heinrich Himmler? Well, if you guess Hugo Boss, you're wrong, because the design of the SS uniform was done by someone that's fairly unknown, a painter that goes by the name Karl Diebitsch. Karl was a representative of German art and national socialism, which was a movement by painters against abstract art forms as opposed to realistic paintings. That was probably an indicator of the mindset and the direction of the Nazi society at the time. Now, a design doesn't make a uniform. There's a step between designing and manufacturing. Once you create the design, the designer meets skilled tailors and manufacturers in an attempt to convert the design into specifications which could be recorded. And these specifications are later converted into a manual that the manufacturers can use and follow to create the garments. Even though the design was ready, the SS needed a manufacturer capable enough preferably someone who was loyal and a member of the Nazi party. In their search for a suitable manufacturer, they came across Hugo Boss. Hugo wasn't the only manufacturer involved. At its peak, Hugo's company employed 300 personnel, but this wasn't sufficient to meet the requirements of the SS. Hugo, along with other manufacturers, produced and met the requirements of the SS. Hugo Boss could be considered as a link between the drafted design and the SS uniform. Hugo's work was not monotonous. We could jokingly say that he had several clothing lines. 
Hugo was a licensed supplier of uniforms to the Sturmabteilung, Schutzstaffel, Hitler Youth, National Socialist Motor Corps, and several other party organizations. By the year 1938, Hugo Boss predominantly worked towards producing Wehrmacht uniforms and eventually Waffen-SS uniforms. Hugo's business that he restarted from scratch had reached heights it had never been before. Sales were at an all-time high and one could say that he was definitely back in the game. Well, he was in the game, but not for long. Once World War II ended, the large supply demand for uniforms stopped. But this was the least of concerns for Hugo. Germany was going through the denazification. If that term wasn't obvious enough, it basically meant that allies were getting rid of the Nazi war criminals and the influential and prominent members of the Nazi party and those involved with the Nazi movement. The Allies classified Hugo Boss's involvement as minor. He was convicted and he only had to pay a penalty of 25,000 Reichsmark. This could be considered quite a fortune back in the day as this was nearly $70,000 back then. Today, this could easily be worth over $1 million. And the interesting fact was this was not for producing uniforms. The Allies understood the war economy. They knew that every company had to produce something for the war. This penalty was for the use of forced labor. It is believed that Hugo Boss employed around 140 forced laborers and 40 French prisoners of war. The level of sanitation and hygiene was very poor. The availability of water and food supplies were very uncertain. The laborers who worked under him were abused. They were often threatened with the possibility of sending them back to the concentration camps. This was considered a crime against humanity. However, he did do some benefit to the workers as he eventually provided a canteen for their food rather than eating from a labor camp. But these actions do not have enough good to outweigh the bad. He was stripped of the rights of running his business until he paid his dues. Eventually, Hugo paid this fee and he could run his business again. With his actions and relation to the Nazi party, could he really be considered as a convinced Nazi or was it just business? Hugo was said to keep a photograph of him alongside Adolf Hitler, which was taken at Berghof the Obersalzburg retreat at his apartment. The managers that Hugo had employed were National Socialists who were considered to be admirers of Hitler. Hugo Boss eventually passed away in 1948. It wasn't Hugo but his son-in-law Eugene Holy who took over the ownership and running of the company that produced the first fine suit under the Boss name. The company initially went back to doing what it did best, supplying uniforms. In 1950, the first order for suits was received and the company expanded to 150 employees by the end of the year. In 1969, Eugen retired and gave the company to his sons, Joshin and Uwe. They decided it was time for the company to go international. The first branded boss suits were produced in 1970 and in 1977, the brand eventually became a registered trademark. A couple of years later, they started diversifying even further. Boss released their first branded fragrance in the year 1984, and in 1989, Boss launched its first licensed sunglasses. In 1991, the Marzotto Textile Group acquired a controlling stake for $165 million, and the brothers retired. Today, Hugo Boss is one of the biggest producers of luxury fashion. But would the company be as influential and successful if more people knew about their dark secret? Let us know what you feel in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more interesting stories.